welcome. Uh, welcome to our 2021 virtual CPP. We are not going to let COVID stop us uh, peace conference. Uh, Andy Fiala reached out to us uh, a couple months ago and everybody knowing that this was the last minute and uphill, uh, we just thought, well, let's let's go ahead and give it a shot. Let's continue our peace work virtually. Uh, let's figure this out and get it done. And as a monitor who's been sitting here watching uh, room one all day, um, it's occurred to me that I didn't realize how much I missed this. And it's been a, a great privilege then to, uh, to listen again uh, to peace philosophers one after the other and to hear the dialogue and the questions. We're turning now to our uh, keynote event uh, and our keynote speaker uh, will be Barry Gann. Uh, Barry is professor of philosophy, uh, recently retired, uh, director of the Center for Nonviolence at St. Bonaventure University, uh, recently retired. He's author of Violence and Nonviolence, an introduction. He was co-editor with Robert Holmes of a leading anthropo uh, <clears throat> anthology on nonviolence, which he has been editing, a nonviolence in theory and practice. Uh, he was editor uh, for um, more than a decade of the, the ACORN uh, Journal of the Gandhi King Society, which uh, I'm privileged to be editing at this point. Uh, for uh, two years, he served as program committee chair of the oldest and largest interfaith peace group in the United States, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. He taught at St. Bonaventure University for 31 years since receiving his MA and PhD degree in philosophy from the University of Rochester in 1981 and 1984, respectively. Prior to that, he taught high school and junior high English for six years. He's married to Miao Li Zhang of a former trainer in microscopic photography for Olympia of China. Excuse me, that's Olympus. He has a daughter uh, who is a writer and works as a school programs coordinator at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And he has a son recently graduated from college. I would encourage you to, uh, to Google the uh, Google Scholar page for Barry. And you can see a nice long page list that you have to click to view more. Uh, so you can see that he's been quite a productive scholar in terms of books and chapters and articles. But turning to Barry's role at the Concerned Philosophers for Peace, uh, Barry has been the president of this organization. He's been the executive director of this organization. And he's been one of the central stalwart pillars of CPP over many, many decades. Uh, those of us who have attended these meetings going way back to the 20th century uh, can remember Barry being there all the time, um, bringing a presence of friendliness, of peace, of welcomeness, uh, of collegiality, which is just so special in actually seasoning the personality of the group. So we're here today to... Um, to ask Barry to address our theme, Peace and Hope in Dark Times. And with that, uh, let, me, uh, let me give it up for, uh, for Barry Gann. So Greg, thank you very much for the uh, generous introduction. I wanna thank the board of CPP for giving me this opportunity. And I also want to thank CPP in general for uh, having provided a venue uh, that enabled me to grow um, in the philosophical world without the uh, competition and backbiting that one finds so often in academic circles. CPP has been uh, very good to a lot of people in that way. And so as much as Greg says, I may have helped cultivate uh, a climate in the CPP, uh, CPP um, really uh, did that uh, with a lot of people chipping in uh, over the decades. So I've got uh, four parts to this paper. The first part uh, I've entitled Dark Times. Uh, the second part of the presentation I've entitled Fears and Insecurities. The third part of the presentation will talk about how 
one can uh, address fears and insecurities uh, by using five different aspects of nonviolence. And the final part of the paper, the conclusion, will just try to bring some of these things to bear on events of the last month, which I thought I shouldn't ignore. I took the theme of the paper from uh, the conference title, uh, Peace and Hope in Dark Times. It's winter. Where I live, the ground is frozen. The trees are bare. No flowers bloom outdoors. The air is cold. The skies are often gray. My wife and I are hunkered down, sheltering ourselves from the current epidemic as much as possible. We are fearful of the virus. We do not venture out much. Summer faded, autumn passed, and winter is here. The fields, brown, are now snow covered. Leaves have fallen from the trees and warmth has left the earth. Times are darker. Donald Trump's ascendancy to the presidency and the sycophancy and unquestioning loyalty of so many of his supporters have eroded faith in the election system, eroded faith in the health system, eliminated or reduced many environmental protections, suppressed voter rights, altered for at least a generation the likelihood of a progressive Supreme Court, increased violent expressions of racism and xenophobia, and as we saw earlier this month, even led US citizens and their president to mount an insurrection against their own government of 231 years. The attack earlier this month on the Capitol was unimaginable four years earlier. Even people like Senator McConnell and Vice President Pence, who sided with Trump for four years but resisted him in the last month, are now facing death threats from irate Americans. Student debt has doubled in the last 10 years and is now over $1.6 trillion. The disparity of wealth, the gap between rich and poor, is greater than at any time in US history, including the days of the robber barons. While top CEO salaries have increased about 1,000% in the last 32 years since the advent of the Reagan administration, typical worker wages have increased by 12%, roughly one hundredth as much. Now almost half a million people in the U.S. have died in one year from COVID-19 because the U.S. favors, as those on the right would say, autonomy over authoritarianism. It might better be called license over life. Times are indeed dark. But these data represent a very distorted view of the total picture. At this very moment, we sit in our homes in front of computers and smartphones connected to wireless networks, communicating almost instantaneously across the earth with one another in matters unimaginable 50 years ago. Our shelves are stocked, our stomachs full. Our homes are heated. We await vaccines that within a year may make possible a resumption of normal lives interrupted by a plague that in other times might have decimated millions more people. That we might even think to call these times dark smells of privilege. To call these times dark times is a narrow view. It's a narrow view because for over two centuries, the US itself has been a major contributor to dark times for others throughout the world. History.com sums up part of this story, quote, from the time Europeans arrived on American shores, the frontier, that edge territory between white man's civilization and the untamed natural world, became a shared space of vast clashing differences that led the US government to authorize over 1,500 wars, attacks, and raids on Indians, the most of any country in the world against its indigenous people. By the close of the Indian Wars in the late 19th century, fewer than 238,000 indigenous people remained 
a sharp decline from the estimated five to 15 million living in North America when Columbus arrived in 1492, end quote. Furthermore, although the US officially abolished slavery over 150 years ago, it still engages in racist practices that a third of its voting population wishes to deny or rationalize. And while the US bemoans its Vietnam War death count of roughly 60,000 people, the death count among the Vietnamese has been estimated at between one and a half and three and a half million. The death count for the US and its allies in Iraq and Afghanistan stands at roughly 17,000 and at one or 200 for the Gulf War. But the death count for the Iraqi and Afghan civilians and fighters in those wars has been estimated in hundreds of thousands and closer to a million if one counts the years of embargo on Iraq during the 1990s. From 1798 to 2020, the US used its armed forces abroad in all but 22 years of its history. If one includes armed force against Native Americans and during the Civil War, then the US used its armed forces against peoples of other nations in every year of its history but three, 1947, 1957, and 1961. However, even during those three years, the US was busy in building, a uh, busy building and testing nuclear weapons. Also, people in the US, often with the government backing them, have regularly engaged in still other forms of persecution that violate that country's own ideals of political freedom. Perhaps the most blatant instance of these persecutions were the McCarthy hearings of the early 1950s, but the practice continues and is still uh, longstanding. Former US President Trump regularly verbally attacked several of his political opponents for espousing socialist ideals as they campaigned against him for president. Many on the right wing side of the political spectrum verbally attack leaders of Black Lives Matter for having Marxist ideals. Charlie Chaplin, Alexander Berkman, and Emma Goldman were all deported in the 20th century for espousing socialist ideals. Eugene Debs was sent to prison for speaking against war during wartime, an action that remains a crime today under the infamous Espionage Act. Daniel Ellsberg was charged under the Espionage Act for informing the American people of the deceptions involved in the government perpetrating the Vietnam War. Edward Snowden and Julian Assange are today both fighting extradition to the US for alleged violations of the Espionage Act despite their actions having informed the American public of major abuses of power and violations of law by the US government, and despite the fact that Assange isn't even a US citizen or resident. The chair of the Republican Party, Rona McDaniel, at her recent re-election as chair of the Republican Party, continued Donald Trump's divisive and stridently anti-socialist tone saying, quote, I am mad and I'm not going to let socialism rule this country, and I'm going to work with every single one of you to make sure we squash it, and we take back the House and take back the Senate. So Democrats, get ready, buckle your seatbelts, we're coming, end quote. More warlike rhetoric just two days after the right-wing assault on the Capitol. In short, to think that we must merely set a new course from these past four years is to miss the larger, more accurate picture. Dark times are omnipresent, and the US has been a major player in contributing to dark times for many peoples throughout its violent history. Other nations, of course, have contributed to darkness and continue to do so. Individuals of all stripes also contribute to darkness, and the US I must say, has been a refuge for many oppressed peoples throughout its history. But none of this can hide the facts. To borrow some of Martin Luther King Jr.'s language, the U.S. is and has been one of the leading purveyors of violence and dark times in the world. The point of this long recap of violence in U.S. history is simply to illustrate that dark times are not suddenly upon us, brought to us by one person or one party. They have long been part of the fiber of the US.
Oddly, for all of this violence that the US has perpetrated, ostensibly in the name of defending itself, advancing democracy, securing itself, or promoting its economic interests, the US as a nation today feels less secure, perhaps, than ever before. The political divide within the US is greater than at any time in my lifetime. Democrats genuinely believe that Republicans are a threat to the well being of the country. Republicans feel likewise about Democrats. The numbers of white supremacists and police forces across the US has risen substantially. The number of firearms sold in the US this past year is the greatest annual number on record. Universities and students within them refuse to allow this speaker or that speaker on campus, fearful that exposure to extreme or merely different ideas will help to perpetuate or increase violence against others. And while many people have become more vocal in their public expressions, for example, an attorney supportive of Trump recently called for a Homeland Security official either to be drawn and quartered or taken out and shot, others like myself have grown fearful of speaking out. I can't speak for others, but I have censored myself in local media and on social media recently for fear of physical reprisals by those who don't like my ideas. I live in a small town, a lot of people know me. I never felt this fear before. A former student of mine, a right winger, has purchased more weapons recently, and he has railed against proposed limits on ammunition. He's not upset because he feels his target practice is threatened. He's upset because he genuinely believes that his home is threatened by Democrats wanting to move low income families into his neighborhood. And he speaks as if he's ready to do something about it, just as protesters in DC earlier this month morphed into insurrectionists with zip ties and weapons, sporting t-shirts and hoodies, calling for civil war on January 6th and thereafter. Other indicators of US insecurity and fears abound. In 2019, the US through its Special Operations Command, SOCOM, had troops deployed in 141 countries and funding for SOCOM in the last 20 years has quadrupled to $13 billion annually. In most of these instances, the reason for these deployments and the nature of these deployments is kept from the general public. For decades, the US has by far sold more weapons and spent more money on its military than any other country in the world. Today, the US maintains approximately 800 military bases in over 70 countries, and it shares with Russia the dubious distinction of possessing about five times as many nuclear weapons each as the rest of the world combined, namely between 5,500 and 6,500 nuclear weapons each nation with about one third of them deployed. The treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons became international law last week on January 22nd, binding on all signatories. None of the nuclear powers has yet signed the treaty. So however powerful the US may think itself economically or militarily, the US does not feel more secure, it feels less secure. This holds whether one is a Democrat, a Republican, a Trumpist, a conservative, a socialist. The US wallows in fear. In the 1920s, it was fear of communism. In the 1930s, it was fear of fascism. In the 1950s, it was fear of communism again. As the violent crime rate dropped in the 1990s in cities across the nation, it was fear of domestic crime. At that time, Congress and President Clinton increased funding for police, allowed police to purchase discarded military hardware, and stiffened penalties for undocumented and documented immigrants, removing from them even the right of habeas corpus. The nation began to focus on all forms of abuse in homes, at school, at work, advertisements peddling drugs to cure this illness or that disease multiplied on media, Concerns about bullying evolved into workshops, policies and blame directed at bystanders. The Tea Party and those who underwrote it capitalized on white fears 
of an African-American as president. The defeat of the US in the Vietnam War, the attacks of 9-11, and the nearly two decade long military involvements in Iraq and Afghanistan have only punctuated the truth that military power neither secures a nation nor soothes a nation's fears and insecurities. Military power doesn't reduce fears and insecurities for several reasons. First, military training creates in soldiers a mindset of kill or be killed. It's a mindset conducive to increasing fears and insecurities. Second, family members of people in the military experience fears and insecurities about whether their family member will be deployed, about whether their family member, if deployed, will die or be injured. Third, a trillion dollar per year defense budget takes vast sums of money away from services and infrastructure that might otherwise improve the health and well being of the population as a whole. Fourth, even soldiers returning alive from combat often suffer permanent war wounds, physical and psychological, that add to stress, increasing fears and insecurities, not only in them, but in all whom they encounter. Finally, military action in other parts of the world increases animosity among all the groups against whom the military fights. And the deaths, injuries, and other harms inflicted by the military expand that animosity exponentially via family members and friends of those afflicted. This animosity helps generate further fears and insecurities among those in the nation responsible for that animosity. So, how does the U.S. soothe its fears and insecurities? Or perhaps I should say, how should we? A little over 10 years ago, in an address as president of CPP, I delivered a talk called Peacemaking. In that talk, I outlined four aspects of nonviolence. Since then, I've identified a fifth. And these five aspects of nonviolence are tied together by a theme that I did not address 10 years ago, the idea of cultivation. Cultivation is a process that occurs over time. It's not a single action. It's not a single achievement. One cultivates one's musical talents. One cultivates one's garden. One cultivates friends. One cultivates one's temperament. Cultivation is a series of actions carried out steadily and somewhat religiously over time. It is a thread that runs throughout these five aspects of nonviolence. So I want to look at these five aspects through the lens of cultivation. The first aspect, a point driven home to me years earlier by Bob Holmes, is that it is not enough to work toward peace. One must consider the means by which one works toward peace. Gandhi made the point exceptionally well in a statement that of all his statements is my favorite. Quote, the means may be likened to a seed, the end to a tree. And there is just the same inviolable connection between the means and the end as there is between the seed and the tree. End quote. I swim daily. I set a goal for myself each day of swimming a set number of strokes and on some days I get in the pool and try to swim fast to finish up quickly. I don't enjoy those days as much. And lately I've learned to focus more on each stroke, counting without a set number of strokes in mind. I have found that when I do that, I swim more relaxedly, I don't grow as tired, and I often swim farther. I achieve my goals more often and more readily by focusing on the means, not the end. Richard Taylor, a philosopher with whom many of you are acquainted, once told me that the first thing he did each early morning was to write at least one page of philosophy. He said that at the end of the year, he usually had enough written that he could edit it into a book. He focused on the means. Or in the words of A.J. Musty, there's no way to peace, peace is the way. Or to quote Musty again, we cannot have peace if we are only concerned with peace. War is not an accident. It is the logical outcome of a certain way of life. 
if we want to attack war, we have to attack that way of life, end quote. I cultivate my swimming by focusing on the means, not the end. Taylor cultivated his writing in the same way, and Musty is urging us to cultivate our desire for peace in the same way. The second aspect is that nonviolent means must entail not aiming to make anyone worse off. As Plato said, it is better to be harmed than to harm. As Jesus said, do good to them that hate you. We may not justifiably engage in violent preemptive actions. Such actions involve making judgments about decisions that others might make, not about actions that they are now carrying out. Most of us, of course, are not regularly engaged in making people worse off. We are just carrying on with our lives, and we are often surprised to learn that in the course of doing so, we have hurt others. Not making others worse off requires paying attention to what it means to do violence to others, to harm others intentionally or negligently. It means recognizing that when I get in a car and drive somewhere, I should be aware that I'm going to be squashing dozens or hundreds of insects. It means that when I purchase meat in a supermarket, I should be aware that I'm paying someone to raise animals uh, and kill them for me. It means that I should be aware that when I speak quickly, reacting to something I don't like to hear, I may needlessly antagonize or hurt the person to whom I'm responding. Thus, not making others worse off requires at least in my case, changing some of my habits. And this requires cultivating new habits. What new habits must be cultivated in order not to make others worse off? Specifically, one must be sensitized to what constitutes violence and even more specifically, what constitutes harm. When we bother to think about it, we are usually pretty adept at determining when we are making someone else worse off. The difficult cases like these on the slide are where we disagree most often. For example, a husband and wife might disagree on whether or not to punish a child in this way or that. The husband may feel that punishment makes the child worse off. The wife may feel that punishment will teach the child that there are consequences for misbehavior. Similarly, Jews may disagree on whether a two-state solution makes Israel, Israelis and Palestinians worse off or better off. The settlement of such disputes is extremely complicated. The point, however, is that as long as one is sensitizing oneself to the question of whether one is making people worse off or better off, one is engaged in cultivating peaceful approaches to problem solving. Sometimes, not making others worse off is as simple as making a decision. Vegetarianism is a decision. It's, it's a decision I've gone back on several times in my life, but in the end, it's simply a decision. It's a decision not to kill animals. Gandhi recognized that it is impossible to live without being violent, but he also recognized that it's possible to minimize the violence we do to a much greater extent than we are usually willing to acknowledge. And our culture is a violent culture because of many actions that we have taken, actions that we could cease with simple decisions. The third aspect is that peacemaking entails prudent planning and actions that anticipate crisis situations. Such planning and action minimize or reduce the likelihood of future violence. That is, <clears throat> acting nonviolently means acting for the long term, not relying upon the ability to respond in crises. In my classes, I require students to turn in a minimum number of questions and comments on reading assignments. I'm able to tell at the outset of the semester who will be earning an A in the class and who will be doing worse by noting how many questions have been turned in at the end of the first three weeks. I've actually conducted experiments like this, writing down what grades I expect uh, months in advance before I even know who students are, just on the basis of uh, the work they've done in the first two or three weeks. 
The students who earn the lowest grades in class are those who wait until there are only enough classes left to meet the minimum requirement of questions submitted. And then invariably, some issue arises and they can't meet the minimum. Students who wait until the last minute to write papers often end up plagiarizing. The circumstances have become crises, but they could have been addressed earlier and not become a crisis. This is a matter of planning, of anticipation, of being willing to invest more early on. Governments in the name of keeping taxes low are usually not willing to invest more early on. And then when a crisis arises, the solutions become extreme. These behaviors run contrary to the concept of cultivation. An example of careful planning was my own residential street, a brick paved street that hadn't been repaired in over a hundred years. The city was eventually going to tear up all the bricks and pave the street because it had become so bumpy. But before it came to that, I circulated a petition among all residents on the street, lobbied our city council with many neighbors and worked over a period of about three years to convince the city that it was in the long-term interest of taxpayers to reinvest in the brick lined street. The city investigated, found grants for which they could apply and ended up replacing all the sidewalks and water and sewer lines. And now we have a beautiful brick paved street with the original bricks, newly planted trees, newly installed sidewalks and driveway aprons that will last perhaps for another 100 years. People from other neighborhoods in the city have asked me, why won't they do that with my street? And I tell them to organize and lobby, but they don't. They don't cultivate. The fourth aspect was that acting nonviolently requires a creative tension between working on oneself while working to make the world a better place. The demands that the current pandemic have placed upon us have enabled us to spend more time with ourselves. And these demands have made it possible for each of us to develop further the talents that we take pleasure in developing from physical conditioning to cooking, from reading and writing to sewing and practicing a musical instrument from organizing social activities online to gardening. In the final analysis, all any of us seeks is a world where each person is free to develop one's talents to the greatest potential in ways that may enhance everyone's life. To the extent that we cultivate our talents, all the while sensitizing ourselves not to engage in behaviors that make others worse off, we improve ourselves and the world. A fifth aspect of nonviolence, one that I did not discuss 10 years or so ago, is crucial to nonviolent political action. And that is that actions must be local and replicable. A national movement is not a million man or woman march on Washington or Moscow or Cairo. It's a local action that can be replicated nationally. Occupy Wall Street is an example of such an action, though it lacked specific goals. What the Republicans have done with local and state legislatures beginning in the late 1970s is actually a better example. They cultivated leaders locally, nourishing and breeding them for offices higher up over decades. It's also what the Communist Party did in China in the 1920s and 1930s, leading to its culminating revolution in 1949. And it is to a lesser degree what the Tea Party began in 2010 that has unfortunately morphed into QAnon. But these were local movements that became national. This is what needs to be happening now among progressives. And why do they have to be local movements? Because national movements are too large to be managed nonviolently. When one works locally, focusing nonviolently on means rather than ends, those with whom one disagrees are hard put to be angry or distrustful. I have local acquaintances whose political views are 180 degrees different than mine. They go on cruises with Rush Limbaugh. Seriously, they do. We used to write op-eds aimed, and I mean aimed, at each other. I don't do that anymore. And these folks regard me as a good person, and I think of them the same. <laughs> 
we're not merely polite with one another, we're friendly toward one another, and we actually like each other. I know their local work and they know mine. They've seen me plan local events. I've seen them plan local events. We've watched each other's projects. They've seen me with my children attending local festivals. I've seen them with their children and grandchildren. I shop in their store. We have mutual friends. We've developed trust, something we could not have done if we were both busy with large national actions. Cultivation from raising children to teaching students to shaping public policies reduces fear and resentment in others. This reduction is a byproduct of the aspects previously discussed. It's an end that is realized through the practice of cultivating a focus on means, on not making others worse off, on addressing problems before they become crises, on developing oneself steadily, and on developing local replicable movements. To treat others violently, even in minor ways such as belittling another or unkindly criticizing another, builds resentment and in the case of children, fear as well. These emotions, as Nietzsche well understood, are reactive emotions. They are poisonous and nonviolent practice helps drain such poisons from our lives. Nonviolence nourishes better relationships with others. But too often coming to my conclusion here, those of us engaged in what we think are nonviolent approaches to political circumstances become bewitched by the tactics of nonviolence and forget about addressing the roots of the problems that nonviolent tactics seek to address. For example, the very title of a prominent online journal on nonviolence, Waging Nonviolence is the title, suggests that nonviolent activists are engaged in a war. And perhaps they are, but too often people become the targets of that war when the true targets of anger, fear, resentment, and hatred are ignored. Nonviolence is not nonviolent if it is directed against people. So a recent article by Maria Stephen in Waging Nonviolence suggested that we, quote, exploit the fact that the capital attack backfired, end quote. She calls for holding people accountable and for expelling 100 members of Congress for their role in denying the validity of the recent US presidential election. Then she, then she urges that we address the fear that many of us are feeling. She calls for people to hang banners from bridgeways, bang pots in the streets and show unity against hatred. And she also calls for long-term solutions to the deep-seated divide in the country. Some of these tactics are helpful to be sure, but it's not just the fear and anger of those on the left that must be addressed. I know I have that fear. I confess that given my local notoriety among Trump supporters and former Tea Party members, I nowadays make sure that my window shades are closed as soon as it's dark out, no joke. But doing more damage is the anger that people on the right and the left direct at each other. The people on the right who invaded the Capitol and those supportive of such efforts also have fear and anger. And one of the best ways to address that fear and anger, that resentment and hatred is not to punish, but repair. So how does a nonviolentist address violent lawbreakers, people who engaged in seditious actions sorry, and threaten others. Although nonviolence does not countenance penalizing people who have done wrong, dangerous people should be locked up and not allowed access to weapons. And many of the Trumpists are dangerous and angry and have access to weapons. But I want to draw some lines here. We are all entitled to beliefs and we are all entitled to voice our beliefs, but we are not entitled to act on our beliefs in ways that aim to overturn a government through deliberately harmful means. So while I'm not suggesting that we lock up people who have ideas that differ from ours, I am suggesting that people who are angry enough and dangerous enough to harm or threaten the well-being of others do need to be locked up. They should be locked up not because they deserve to be punished, but because they are dangerous.
the U.S. needs to break free of its desire to do violence to others, to make worse off those whom it regards as threats. So those who do wrong, as Plato said, should be re-educated. Some of this education might entail training in citizenship, civics, and training in critical thinking. The Quakers used to provide prisoners with garden plots, and that's a very good idea. Gardening teaches patience, planning, hope, and care. Some of it should entail training and self-governance, running many aspects of the institutions where such people might be incarcerated. Some of it should entail repairing the infrastructure of this country. In this way, people will learn how to improve themselves by developing their skills. They will learn planning and patience. They will learn greater tolerance of others. They will, in short, learn cultivation of themselves and of others. Many on the right would call this brainwashing. It's not. There's a difference between truth and fiction and people need to be taught how to distinguish one from the other. Good evidence from bad, rhetoric from reasoned argument. Such an approach might easily be abused, but what is crucial to such an approach is that it be undertaken with goodwill, something difficult for many opponents of Trump to muster. Kant famously said that the only intrinsically good thing is a goodwill, for anything else considered good could be used malevolently. Cultivating these five aspects of nonviolence, I would argue, cannot be done jointly without a goodwill. Jointly, I believe they are necessary and sufficient conditions for a goodwill. And a goodwill drains poison, elevates oneself and others, nourishes better relations with others. Protests in the street need to stop. They invite provocation. They invite violence. They can't be controlled. People on social media need to call out verbal attacks on others in much the same way that Mothers Against Drunk Driving mounted a national movement that called out drunk driving and helped make designated drivers part of our culture. We cannot tolerate among ourselves the bashing of those with whom we disagree. We can bash the ideas civilly, but we need, as US President Joe Biden said in his inaugural address, to end this uncivil war. And as he also said, we need to end it not by the example of power, even nonviolent power, but by the power of example. Adopting an attitude of cultivation entails hope. One can't plant, can't plan, can't practice, can't cultivate in despair. These very actions require hope, an expectation that something good can come from what one is doing. However, to hope without acting is futile and contributes to despair. But it is especially when times are dark that one must prepare soil, gather seeds, plant them, and create an environment in which the seeds can grow. One trusts without guarantees that nature will take care of the rest, that during the dormant period, energy is building within those seeds and the cycle of nature will continue enabling the seeds to sprout in the warmer weather and burst forth to provide sustenance and beauty in a world previously dark. The seeds must be planted in children and we must be doing more to make our schools places that students and their parents value for what they learn there. This hasn't been the case for much of the population of the US for a couple of generations. And so we must cultivate, especially in dark times, these five aspects of nonviolence. The elimination of fear and resentment, the reduction of the poison in ourselves and in others will come with time only if we can cultivate, especially in ourselves by way of example, peace and hope in dark times. These things can't be hurried. I end with a Chinese allegory from Meng Tzu called or pulling up the seedlings to help them grow. A farmer worried that his seedlings were not growing fast enough. So one day he pulled up the shoots throughout the field to make them look taller. Returning home very tired, the farmer told his family what he did. 
his son ran immediately to the field to find all the shoots had withered. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. 